<laughs> okay. Hi, uh, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me down here. It's, it's very nice uh, to be back to SDSU. Uh oh. That, do we see flickers? It's not flickering here. Okay. Um, so uh, I started at uh, UC Irvine in uh, 2016. And so I'll tell you about the work that I've been doing since then. Um, so I just submitted my uh, tenure package um, during the fall. So it's, it's kind of a collection of different projects that uh, we've been working on. And what I'm gonna tell you about is uh, how uh, different phenomena will emerge from uh, living collectives. And uh, so the collective that we're gonna talk about is uh, bacteria, okay? I'm in the uh, Department of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, also have a joint appointment in molecular biology and biochemistry. Uh, and so uh, a lot of our work has an interface between biology and physics, and you'll see that as a, uh, a theme. So I'll start with uh, just what is biological physics and why um, do we study uh, biological physics. Um, so biological physics, um, this, my description is that we try to understand how different properties and functions emerge from biological materials. I like to try to think about this as a materials science, um, but that material science, uh, when the materials come together, they are endowed with very interesting properties and very interesting functions. And we're trying to understand um, how that emerges. Okay, so what are biological materials? Um, so one example uh, I have here is a um, flagellum. This is something that is contained within your bodies. It's also something that's contained uh, with, uh, within bacteria. Um, your bodies use the cilia um, to kind of uh, rotate around and spin liquids and, and move materials around. Um, and what you'll notice from the structure is that it, it, it has this um, kind of core, this rotor and stator um, design. It looks like it's something that's designed, right? So it has this rotor and then it has this stator and it spins around much as an electrical motor might spin around. If you were to design an electrical motor today, it would look almost exactly like this. And so um, what's amazing is that uh, the, kind of the, the materials have little function alone. Um, so each of these individual building blocks alone have no have little function. They're amino acids. There's only um, 20 basic building blocks. But then when you start to collect them together, um, it builds a structure and the structure has uh, very interesting properties and very interesting functions. It usually requires uh, some assembly. Um, and again, it's, it's amazing that you can encode all life functions with just this, um, these 20 basic building blocks. You know, it would be kind of like going to a Lego store and um, you know, just having 20 different Legos and just building all types of life just from that. Um, and so what's interesting is that like, this is a structure uh, from 2006, okay? And what happens is if you zoom in to this even more, uh, it's the same structure, but we're gonna have higher resolution about 15 uh, years later. Um, it looks like a material. It, it doesn't look like just like an organ. It doesn't necessarily look like uh, some kind of um, biological entity. It looks like some kind of material that was put together. And so I think we're kind of at this cusp where the, the distinction between materials physics and biological physics is something that is starting to become blurred. And, and, and that's, I, I think, what's really interesting here. I look at um, bio, biology as a material as a type of material science and this this material is endowed with very interesting properties that we know as as life okay and so we're going to look at this as in terms of inert materials and then when they assemble into a collective um, they're going to have some kind of function okay yes yes it's, it's, it's a good it's a good question um, so uh, there are I think that bio, biophysics uh, tends to describe um, a lot, uh, can describe a few things. One, it tends to describe um, kind of structural studies um, and uh, how do uh, kind of structures uh, lead to um, biological uh, um, activity? Um, like how does an enzyme function, um, for example, is one question. And um, so that's kind of one end of the spectrum. Biophysics can also be um, applying uh, physical, um, uh, kind of approaches to biological systems. And so that's what we tend to describe as um, biological physics, as um, a way of uh, studying biology, but using physics tools um, to, to do it. Yeah. So biological physics is really the subpiece of the physics of mechanisms, biological physics, or biophysics is a physical 
Yes, yes, yes. That's that's another way of uh, describing that. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so what are um, some themes that we see in uh, biological physics and in biological materials? Um, and something as a physicist, when one kind of uh, approaches this, uh, it, it's kind of it's interesting to see that the systems operate uh, by exception. Where as physicists, you're trying to look for general rules that apply to everything. Um, you're trying to look for you're trying to generalize things and uh, you know describe them using uh, different uh, equations. Um, and but with biology, what kind of uh, strikes you at first is that the solutions seem to be very specific to um, a particular uh, kind of organism or a particular setting, okay? And so general principles are kind of harder to come by um, in biology. Um, the physics of biological systems can be very complex. Um, if you think about a photoreceptor, um, this is something that you use uh, all the time. And um, it, in order to understand a, a photoreceptor, um, one may need to uh, understand a, a bit of fluid mechanics. Um, there's certainly a lot of statistical mechanics. Um, if understanding how to convert a, uh, a photon uh, into a biological, uh, energy is uh, involves some quantum mechanics. Um, there's electricity and magnetism, and these concepts are all rolled into one system. So it makes, from a physics standpoint, um, biological systems can be incredibly complex. Um, and what what my work is finding in uh, um, is that the solutions to a lot of these biological systems really are at the interface of biology and physics. And what I mean by that is that a physicist alone studying this material may not understand what's going on. And a biologist um, studying this, uh, this system alone may not understand it. You, one needs to have an appreciation for how both the biology and the physics works uh, and to really understand how things are working. And we'll see a few examples of that. Um, the overarching goals in my uh, lab are really to identify um, general principles. So what can we find? Uh, we have all these um, systems that operate, operate by exception. So can we find any kind of unifying principles that allow us to um, try to generalize um, how do you give rise to life? Okay, so um, basically what we're trying to find out is what are emergent properties? Um, how do you um, go from an inert material um, to something that gives rise to life? Um, my lab uses bacteria as uh, the, uh, a living system. And, and the reason is that it's one of the simplest living systems. Um, I put simple in quotations, again, because it, in order to understand uh, one of the, the simplest uh, life forms, it's very complex. There's just, there's a lot that we don't understand uh, and that we're, we're working on. Um, bacteria are, are very small. Uh, they're one micron. Uh, the, the laws of physics that um, kind of guide what happens is uh, described as low Reynolds number. Um, one way of thinking about that is that there's no inertia. They're under really intense uh, forces. Once the, the bacteria stops producing a force, it just comes to a stop, a uh, screeching halt. So it's kind of like they're embedded in some really, really viscous um, solution. Um, bacteria don't have internal compartments. Um, so if you're used to studying mammalian cells, um, you hear about a nucleus, you hear about like a, a lysosome or something like that. Bacteria don't have those compartments. And I like to think about them as minimalists um, that are um, that have low complexity. Um, the striking thing is that they are very successful organisms. Okay? They've been around for a long time, and um, they are among one of the largest number of organisms on the planet. So about 10 to 30 cells um, is estimated. So um, that they are second to only viruses, and viruses uh, kind of have their own story. Um, that is very interesting. Um, I like to think about this in terms of the robustness of life. On, on Earth, okay? And what I mean by that is if you just look at the historical record um, along in terms of billions of years, um, is uh, bacteria and archaea, um, the predecessors to bacteria came out along uh, about uh, almost uh, a little over three billion years ago. They've been on this planet and they've been kind of dominating this planet um, for a long time, okay? For most of the, the Earth's history. Um, plants came about at some point um, and we, you know, we, we like to think about um, dinosaurs as ruling the planet. They did indeed rule the planet for a long time, hundreds of millions of years. Um, and then mammals came about, okay? And so we're kind of concerned about the diversity of life uh, right now, but it's, it's mostly the diversity of mammals that we're interested in. And then you kind of see the sliver here that looks like, um, like an error uh, on, on, the, uh, uh, on the slide. And can anyone tell me what, what this may represent on the, the time scale? Exactly, humans. So humans have been around for a very short amount of time, 
um, comparatively uh, to the, the record of life um, on, on a planet. Okay, and so I like to think about bacteria as, as kind of um, giving us insight into um, historically what is, uh, what is successful, what, is, um, what gives rise to life. Okay, um, bacteria have been long described as single cell organisms. Okay, and, um, and, and so what we're learning slowly is that when bacteria start um, coming, uh, start grouping together, maybe with other bacteria or with themselves, we find different uh, types, types of properties that emerge. Okay, and so um, really the, the way we uh, approach the problem is trying to think, can we think of bacteria as more of a multicellular organism? Okay, and some of the uh, uh, conversations that I had today with, with different faculty was were really uh, inspiring and kind of think along those lines. Okay, um, and so an example of a multicellular organism that, that, that cooperates at the single cell level is a muscle tissue. Okay, so you have, um, uh, in, every time you kind of move a muscle, uh, it's, it, it's due to the cooperative effects of individual cells that uh, kind of move all at once. Okay, and that gives rise to new function. And so we're, what we're trying to do is uh, we're trying to see if bacteria have um, a similar type of trait where individually they do something, but together as a collective, um, they give rise to a new function. Okay. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about bacteria. Uh, they self-organize into biofilms and swarms. I'll go, you've probably heard of biofilms before and probably don't know, haven't quite heard of swarms. I'll go into that uh, a little in this talk. Um, but we asked the question, what happens when bacteria are together, when they work collectively um, in these types of um, formats? What properties emerge? Um, and uh, most uh, importantly is how do these emergent properties produce robustness? Why can these things lead to uh, an organism that can survive for billions of years on this earth? Okay? And, and so something like, um, you know, it, we talk about um, kind of species disappearing on earth, one thing that is for certain is that bacteria will be around for billions more years. And so they have this really high level of robustness. And so how, how do they gain this? So um, in my lab, we use um, several different approaches from that are inter interdisciplinary. Um, one of the approaches is um, biological physics. Okay, so we use optical microscopy. We use electron microscopy. We really want to zoom into um, how bacteria work, um, scanning a, a microscopy. Uh, and right now we're working on cryogenic electron microscopy. Um, we also use techniques such as microfluidics to manipulate the environment so that we can really understand um, how fluids affect bacteria. And then we use traditional bio biology tools such as molecular biology, genetics, and uh, biochemistry. Most of my lab is a wet lab, um, but we do some theory and simulation when it's necessary. And that's kind of the fun part. Um, I found that in physics, you tend to be either an experimentalist or an, a theorist, but um, as a biological physicist, you can be both, which is like <laughs> really exciting. Um, a lot of the work that we do has uh, relevance to human health. And the reason is that um, a lot, there's a lot of public interest in human health. There's, there's a lot of um, funding there. And so um, we're interested in fundamental questions about uh, life, but um, a lot of the questions will directly address um, potential human health issues. So um, the outline uh, of this talk is going to be kind of split into four projects. Um, and uh, the first one is about um, just how bacteria behave in flow. We're gonna talk about how collectives organize into structures. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, electron states inside bacteria, okay? Um, and that uh, deals with bacterial metabolism. We're gonna talk about how bacterial um, communities will communicate with each other. And then lastly, we'll talk, uh, we'll talk about how we can overcome defenses uh, within bacteria to try to develop new antimicrobials. Um, any questions before we, we kind of go into nitty gritty about things? Okay, so the bacteria that we, um, and if you have a question, please just interrupt me. Um, so the, the bacteria that we're interested in studying is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, this is something that is, uh, uh, kind of ubiquitous, okay? So it's in the dirt, we spread it around. Um, it's medically relevant and it's uh, opportunistic. So this is something that's uh, everywhere in the environment, soil, water, on the surfaces of plants and animals. And um, they can be found as either single swell, single cells or in these large swarms that go up to 10 to the ninth or more bacteria in, in one collective. Okay? Um, they infect all these different types of hosts and um, cause a lot of human diseases. Okay? And so, um, 
it's, it's a very robust organism. And that's, that's what kind of drew me to this organism in the first place. It thrives in natural environments and it infects uh, um, humans uh, and animals very well. And one of the um, themes that you see in living organisms is um, that there are fluidic networks. Okay, so flow networks are um, ubiquitous in living systems. You can talk about a lung where there's um, air and water flow. You can talk about uh, leaves where there's um, fluid flow uh, or wings of insects, you name it. Um, there are really interesting um, networks of flow. And, and, and the reason that there is, are these intricate networks is that uh, in order to live, you need to transport material. Okay? And, um, and bacteria are really good at getting into these transport networks. And so our question is, um, how do bacteria behave when they're in these fluidic uh, transport networks? <clears throat> because to, in order to understand um, how they affect health, we need to understand um, how, they, how they thrive or how they behave in these fluidic networks. So the way we study this is by using uh, microfluidic channels. And so this is one of the first projects that we started uh, in the lab when, when I got there. And um, what we can do is we can control the flow uh, inside these microfluidic channels very well. So there's a polymer and then there's bacteria that get flowed here and we can understand exactly um, what happens in this microfluidic device. And the question is um, really what happens when bacteria start forming these large collectives uh, inside these um, uh, fluid devices? Um, and uh, so we first started with just single cells and we wanted to see what happens uh, when they start growing. Uh, so we started with a single cell here and it's kind of just bobbing around. It's bobbing around because um, there's a, a little Brownian motion. Uh, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn on the flow to simulate what happens inside uh, a living organism. And so, uh, so what, what we know from classical physics is that if you kind of impart a force on a cell or on an object, um, it should move uh, in, that, in the same direction, okay? And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna have flow going from the top to the bottom. And so um, what should happen to the cell? Um, where should it move? Right, so the bottom, okay? And so, so this is something that was really surprising to us, which is that um, actually the cell will move um, from the bottom to the top, okay? And um, this, uh, this is one of the uh, mechanisms that we described as, um, as, as basically flow is stimulating movement in the opposite direction. And we went on to just describe um, the mechanism behind this. Uh, and, and basically the mechanism is that bacteria um, adhere to the surface and then the flow orients them so that the appendage that attaches them to the surface orients them upstream and this leads to um, upstream behavior. So that, that's what happens at, at the single cell level. And, and that, that was um, something that is, was very surprising and very interesting. Um, but really what we want to do is now see what happens in bacteria inside natural environments don't live as single cells. They, they live as, as large collectives. Um, and so what happens um, to this cell when, when you start getting this large uh, collective? Okay, so questions that we asked were, how does upstream movement impact uh, bacterial collectives in flow? And basically we wanted to identify universal principles that guide uh, the uh, collective in flow. Yes. <laughs> It, it's it's some it has a old pole and a new pole. So when bacteria divide, um, it has something where it just divided from, and it has something that uh, is older. So it's not it's not uh, it's not literally a head or a tail, but cells are apolar. Oh, sorry, sorry. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, so we're trying to identify uh, universal principles. And what we'd like to do is be able to predict the organization of a large number of cells starting from one cell. And maybe one of the reasons you might think that this is important is um, you might think, okay, if I have a cut on my hand um, uh, and a small number of bacteria get in, maybe one bacteria gets in, what's, what's gonna happen to that bacteria? Where does it go? What kind of structures does it form? And how is it going to affect you? Okay, and so that's, that's where we started. Um, and so the way we're going to do this is by um, observing dynamics at single cell. Um, so we're going to use optical microscopy. Um, we're going to uh, try to write down some equations um, to uh, make a predictive model. And we're going to use principles of motility um, to do that. Okay, and so um, this is something that we, uh, uh, we're looking at pseudomonas. These are these little dots here. And then the flow is going from left to right here. Um, and so there's media that's just flowing over here but the bacteria are on the surface crawling upstream uh, in the opposite direction, okay? And so you can see that uh, most of the bacteria are um, moving upstream. Sometimes they go a little bit sideways. And then uh, in some cases, what they actually do is um, some will actually leave the surface. 
Um, and when they leave the surface, they get swept downstream really quickly. Okay. Um, and so we can trace a single cell. Yes, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Yes, that's, that's exactly what. Um, so in a separate study, um, we showed that um, if they are not oriented, um, the flow will orient them so that they're, they're going upstream. It's kind of, uh, imagine if you were, if, if there's a river and you fell into the river uh, and you're getting swept down by the river and you, you took your hands and tried to grab onto a rock, um, you would actually face upstream in that case. And that's ex actually what happens here in, in um, bacteria as well. Yeah, great, great question. Um, and so uh, what we're looking at is, um, we're looking at different qualities um, or different actions that we observe. Um, we observe that bacteria are duplicating when they're on the surface. Um, sometimes they're moving upstream, um, and then sometimes um, they are reattaching to the surface. So we can start with initial attachment here. Um, sometimes they get swept downstream, uh, and sometimes uh, when they duplicate, one of them falls off. But for the most part, um, if you track them over enough um, uh, life cycles, they're going to move upstream. And this is kind of a, a question that, that, uh, um, that we tried to address for a long time because um, I think scientists would say that, okay, bacteria are moving on surfaces, but at some point they're going to move, they're going to get swept downstream uh, because they're going to leave the surface. And so how is that productive? Um, and so we showed that um, it actually is productive over long time scales, um, but there's, there's a lot more to this story. Okay. And so this comes in when we start modeling what's happening. Okay. And so um, we describe the system as having two phases. So we have a surface phase and then we have a bulk phase. Um, the bacteria can move upstream on the surface. So there's, uh, we describe this as advection in the upstream direction. Um, they can detach and move from one phase to another. So they can move from the surface to the bulk and um, they can move in the bulk or um, they can get advected inside the bulk very fast and move downstream. And at some point they can reattach to the surface. So there's a cyclical process um, that involves detachment, attachment and movement upstream and downstream. And so um, we describe this um, using uh, differential equations um, that encode all of these behaviors. So we have upstream advection and downstream advection here on the surface in the bulk. We have that the bacteria are growing um, and then we have that they can exchange between um, different phases. So they can move um, to the bulk or they can move from the bulk um, to the surface. Okay, and so um, our the question, the big question here is um, what happens again, for, starting from one cell now when you put them in these fluidic networks. And to understand this question, we have to understand fluidic networks a little bit better. Um, fluidic networks and living organisms are, for whatever reason, all branched. And we're still trying to understand why they're branched and how they um, get this uh, branched architecture. Um, and so uh, what we did was we tried to apply this model using an environment where um, the fluidics were branched. And we simulated an infection. So you can imagine getting an infection here somewhere in the periphery, such as maybe your fingertip. And we asked, where does the bacteria go um, uh, after they've entered this um, fluidic network? Um, and so the bacteria will start here. And um, on the surface, they, they're um, kind of isolated to one position. And then what happens is that um, they move downstream at the same time. They detach from the surface and move to the bulk. So we're looking at the surface at the top and then the bulk at the bottom. And then um, uh, if you give them a little time to move upstream on the surface, what happens is that they start um, uh, they, they start moving both upstream and they start moving downstream um, in the bulk. And what happens very quickly uh, is that this bacterium can take over a fluidic network very quickly. And so um, we did this as a study to understand how bacteria can disperse once they're inside a fluidic network. And we found that the dispersal is very quick. Um, because of this um, dual mode. So we call this, uh, these modes of switching between the surface and the bulk as dynamic switching. Um, and we did uh, experiments to see if this was true um, also uh, uh, kind of um, in, in real organisms. So we used micro, uh, microfluidic devices where we flowed uh, medium from left to right here. And then bacteria, we um, simulated as an infection here um, through the side channel. And you're just looking at beads right here with, um, they're not bacteria, but this is to establish um, how the flow works um, in, this, uh, in this device. Um, and we added uh, wild type bacteria, um, and then we added bacteria that were not motile uh, because we wanted to make sure that the flow um, was as we expected. Okay, and so, um, uh, so what we would predict is that the bacteria are gonna move upstream and then uh, they're kind of gonna diffuse around the channel. 
And um, because they're able to, uh, to detach from the surface, um, they can move downstream very quickly and they can reattach the surface. And so what happens is bacteria are gonna, um, on average, move upstream, but they also uh, contaminate or colonize all the downstream channels. So they, if you put them inside a fluidic network, they're gonna take over the entire network um, because they, they have all these different ways of moving about the, the fluidic network. Um, and so this dynamic switching is what we found um, enables really efficient dispersal in flow. Um, if you're, so we're looking at dispersal here and in simulations, what we found is that if you're only stuck to the surface and you're only crawling on the surface, you're not gonna get very far in the network um, because you can only move upstream and you can only move upstream very slowly. Um, and if you're, if you're stuck inside the bulk, um, uh, you're not gonna, also not gonna go anywhere because the bulk is moving much faster than the bacteria can swim. It's kind of like if you're again in the river, um, you're not gonna get very far by swimming up river. You're just gonna get swept down. Okay? And so uh, a combination of crawling and maybe jumping um, will get you um, possibly to where you want. And that's exactly what this bacterium has done. So they've, they found an optimum where they um, can use these two modes of uh, motility um, to really disperse throughout a fluid network. So they can really um, colonize and spread very well. Okay? And so this really showed, was really interesting is that the bacteria seem to be really optimized in some sense for um, dispersal. And it was really interesting is that the equations that describe um, this dynamic switching um, arise um, a lot in, inside biology. It wasn't just bacteria. And one place that it arises is in dynamic instability in microtubules. Okay, so what happens with microtubules, um, these are things that help um, the cell um, kind of organize. They also kind of ha have to search the um, cellular space for DNA every time the um, cell divides. And so they have these two modes where it polymerizes and depolymerizes to search space. And that allows them to um, search 3D space very um, efficiently. Um, and th the same equations that describe these two modes, polymerization and depolymerization, um, allow them to um, search a space very efficiently. And so what we found is that um, bacteria are also very efficient at searching space um, using a kind of um, very similar set of dynamics. Um, other examples in, in biology where um, there is search of space is transcription factors. Transcription factors have to search for DNA targets very efficiently. And they do this using two modes, by moving through the fluid and then by attaching to uh, DNA. And so they can turn a 3D problem into a 2D problem um, immune cells and cancer cells also have um, very similar types of dynamics where they're using two modes um, to search space very efficiently. So we see this as a general principle um, that uh, bacteria and um, other biological organisms need to search space very efficiently. And they do this by using um, uh, this biomodal um, approach. So our, and to summarize this part, um, uh, we have uh, done theory and experiment to show that bacterial dispersal and colonization um, can be predicted uh, to a large number of cells, starting from just a single cell. Uh, individually, the bacteria just operate a, as a single cell. They move upstream, but collectively, something else arises. They don't just move upstream, but they disperse downstream as well, and they end up taking over a network. This, sen this creates a sense of robustness um, where they can, uh, it really gives them an advantage to survive. Um, we have uh, dynamic switching is what allows them to, to take over networks. Yes. Yes, yes, so anti motility um, therapeutics, for example, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that that is one area that um, people have thought of to, to try to treat good ones. Yes. Um, and uh, so this uh, the last uh, point is that the dual mode switching uh, maybe is just a general mechanism in biology that um, allows molecules to really search space. Yes. Yeah. Is it different than the code on the surface versus the bulk? That's a great question. Yes. So. Um, nutrient uh, accessibility is not something that we entirely understand. Um, and so in the bulk, uh, there's potentially more oxygen. It depends kind of how close you are to an interface. Um, if the surface is far from that interface, the oxygen availability may be different, but also just um, uh, nutrient diffusion to surfaces is uh, maybe different. Um, so that's, that's something that we're, in, we're kind of looking into 
um, to try to understand metabolism on surfaces. There may be. We, we, we're not. Um, it's. Uh, it, it, it. I guess. Um, yeah. It, we're looking into this. <laughs> There's. It's a bit com complex on surfaces, and it, we'll talk about the surface a little bit more in just a second. Okay. Great. Um, so next, I wanted to tell you about uh, a technology that uh, we're uh, we've developed to study uh, electron states in bacteria, um, and uh, so. This this kind of has been really compelling to me because um, you know like when I learned about bacteria and, and I have a physics background background when I learned about how um, how life works we always learned it as um, kind of there's ATP utilization right so ATP is the car the energy currency of the cell um, and what I was struck by is that um, there's this whole other way of understanding how uh, life um, is is uh, provided with energy and that's as an electron flow. And so um, we, the reason we breathe in oxygen is because we need to take that oxygen and put electrons on it so that the electrons can, can go somewhere else. So um, it's, it, uh, at the fundamental level, a lot of life arises just from a current of electrons. It's very similar to our electronic devices. Um, there's a current of electrons. That current will then power um, everything inside your electronic device. Um, in, inside living organisms, you have um, car electron donors. We get that from carbon and we get them from food. And then those electrons have to go somewhere. Um, we put on oxygen um, to produce CO2. Bacteria use the same, uh, a, a very similar system. Uh, they uh, take oxygen and take electrons um, from carbon sources and uh, put it on uh, oxygen to produce CO2. Uh, and so we're interested in uh, basically, can we measure uh, electron currents inside bacteria. What we like to do as, as a physicist is be able to take a multimeter and just put it on a bacteria and say, um, this is how much amps uh, of electrons are moving. And, um, and that's, that's kind of the ultimate goal. One of the most important electron carriers is NADH, bacteria have this, um, and we also have this. Um, and so we use this technology called uh, fluorescence lifetime uh, imaging microscopy um, to measure NADH states. Um, you've heard of fluorescence, you, you understand fluorescence because uh, you kind of get exposed to it um, all the time, um, in, for example, in these light bulbs. Um, so what's happening with fluorescence is that we're exciting at one wavelength and then you're seeing emission at a different wavelength. Um, and so what we're going to do is something a little bit different where we're going to um, send a pulse of energy in uh, into a material and that's going to excite them and the material is going to emit um, emits, uh, photons and decay very rapidly. So this is something that you've uh, um, also experienced. So when you turn a light off in, in a fluorescent bulb, it doesn't just switch off right away. You'll, you'll notice that it dims. It takes uh, microseconds for it to dim. And that's this emission decay, this fluorescence lifetime. And what we're gonna do is uh, we're exciting NADH, um, which is this electron carrier um, at a specific uh, excitation pulse. And we can watch its decay uh, inside living organisms. Um, and, and so using a Fourier transform, what we can do is map NADH states uh, onto a, a, what we call a phaser um, and doing this phaser analysis. And we can see that um, NADH that is bound to a protein will map to one place and then NADH that's free um, will uh, map to a different place. And this allows us to determine just what state is the electron carrier in inside a living organism. So it brings us closer to this ability to use a multimeter and just see what is the electron flow like inside this living organism. And so we're gonna do this um, with something that's related to human health. Uh, we're gonna do this with bacteria um, that are attaching to surfaces. Okay? And so surface attachment is important uh, because it's one of the initial steps of infection. And so what we're gonna do is seeing, is does electron flow uh, change when bacteria are swimming and then when they start infecting, does that somehow change? And so to think about this from a, a kind of physical um, standpoint, um, bacteria that are, uh, attached to surfaces are under very different forces um, than when they're swimming around. When they're attached to surfaces, there's shear stress, there's uh, membrane forces, there's tensions on the appendages that attach them to the surfaces. And so the physical environments are very different. And so the, the question that, that's driving us is, um, do, do these different physical environments 
correspond to different um, electron uh, states. Okay, distinct electron mechanical states are electron carrier states different. Okay, and so um, we're going to apply this. Uh, yes. Uh, so that, that's that. Uh, I don't know. Um, it's a good question. Like how much uh, that bacteria um, do deliberately? Um, they can attach to surfaces, um, and sometimes they attach reversibly, so they can attach uh, momentarily and, and jump off. Or sometimes they attach and um, stay on uh, very robustly. And what what determines uh, those two different behaviors uh, is is not clear. And, and it's kind of what we're we're trying to go after. So we think that um, that the electronic state may have something to do with that. Okay. Um, so we're gonna use this uh, fluorescence imaging to, to see what's going on inside bacteria. Um, if we just use fluorescence, not fluorescence uh, lifetime, uh, we can see a distribution of NADH within the cell. Uh, now, when we take the lifetimes of different uh, positions in the cell, we can see that there are different clusters of uh, metabolic activity or, or electronic activity um, inside the cell, which was, was one of our first um, really nice results is that you could see subcellular structures um, here inside the bacteria. Um, and we can, we can look at bacteria from the single cell all the way up to these um, larger biofilms. And uh, we could do that while they're swimming around. And we could also do that um, while they're, they're attached to surfaces. And what we found was that um, during this critical transition, when they become virulent, when they start attaching to surfaces, um, the, these two populations diverge in um, electron state. So um, it started around four hours and around between four hours and six hours, what happens is that the, um, uh, the NADH um, will move to a different uh, state. So they'll be, become bound to proteins if they uh, stay in this low virulent state. In the high virulent state where they're attaching to surfaces, um, there's a lot more free NADH around. So the electron carrier state is actually not um, turning over as much, uh, and there's just a lot of free um, electrons. So it's, it's as if we interpret this as, as the electron currency is slowing down in cells that are becoming um, a bit more virulent. Okay. Um, and so th that was, was really surprising to us, um, although uh, because this had never been uh, observed before, that surface attachment really results into this um, bifurcation into different electron carrier states. Um, and so this led us to think that maybe electron states can determine uh, whether or not a cell becomes highly infectious or not. Um, and so that's something that we're, we're continuing to work on. The, the biology behind this is, is very complicated because there's so many different um, places where metabolism um, affects uh, bacteria. Um, and so uh, using fluorescence lifetime, uh, we have been able to use, uh, to create a spatial map of electron carrier states in uh, biofilms. Um, a shift in electron carrier states uh, corresponds to a different mechanical state. So it tells you whether they are attached to surfaces or they're swimming. Um, and then uh, this, the really um, important part is this, that the change in electron carrier state coincides with the activation of infection mechanisms. It's as if the bacteria ran out of energy and when it became, uh, ran out of energy, it suddenly became more infectious and uh, willing to um, you know, kill uh, other organisms around it. Um, and so this is also something that we're thinking about as an anti-infection strategy that perhaps one can manipulate the energy dynamics within bacteria, and this could um, uh, potentially control their ability to infect. Yeah. How do you know what, which one happens? Causality is, is a, uh, a challenge for us right now. So, okay. um, so what, we're what we did in some uh, uh, experiments was we altered just the me metabolic pathways. Um, and so we changed uh, whether it produced more NADH uh, reduction or not. And we could see a corresponding change in, um, in, in virulence factors. Okay, so if you have like NADH, Yes, yeah, and it become more virulent. So, so there's, um, I, I think um, actually, so they, they don't go and stick more. They, they just become more virulent. Whether, what causes them to stick more is a different question. Um, and so we, we don't know that part. We're just looking at, uh, are, are you stuck to the surface or not? And then um, can we change the um, electron carrier state in both the swimming ones or the ones on the surface? If we change um, the, uh, the metabolic state on the, in the ones on the surface, we can actually remove their virulence um, or disable their virulence. I thought it was 
Based on the fair speaking. No, no. So we actually have host cells, um, and I don't show that yet. So, so, um, so we can have them interact with host cells and see if the host cells are, are killed. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Um, so I'll move on to this third part, um, which is about long-range communication. Um, and so, uh, so this is a, a. I'm sorry. This is a shift in gears. The topics um, are kind of. Um, uh, a little bit uh, kind of diverse. But so we started this project um, in 2018 and we just wanted to ask the question, how do bacteria respond to dangers as a collective? Okay. And um, one of the dangers to bacteria um, is, is viruses or bacteriophage, which I, I'm sure you heard about uh, on this campus. And the amazing thing is that bacteria and viruses are just really inseparable partners. Um, you don't find uh, bacteria in nature without some kind of virus that, that can, can't infect it. Um, and so uh, they live, um, they, they, you know, they, they are very successful on this earth, but they're always trying to kill each other. Um, and so like, uh, so how does this work? Um, like what are the mechanisms that allow them to kind of survive? Um, and so on the earth, there's about 10 to 30 bacteria, and then there are about 10 to 30 first uh, bacterial viruses. And so one of the basic questions that we asked in 2018 was, if you had a virus um, that could infect a bacterial population, how does it sp spread spatially? Okay. And, uh, or another question was how, basically, how do viruses spread throughout a population? Um, and what we had started from was this, this central, this, this dogma from biology that um, bacteriophage would come in and um, inject its uh, DNA uh, uh, into bacteria. And then it, the bacteriophage would replicate and then it would bust open and then you have more phage that infect other things. Okay. And so this is kind of a, uh, the idea here is that it's a single cell model. And um, this model really ignores the spatial component of infection. Okay. It tells you what happens, but it doesn't tell you um, kind of where things will progress or how things will progress spatially. Okay. And so um, uh, here's an example that uh, a lot of what we know about how bacteria phage work came from uh, kind of well-mixed environments. You have bacteria here, you add phage here, and then it clears because the, the bacteria are gone. And this is an example of a well-mixed homogeneous environment. But we know in nature that uh, environments and in, in, inside animals, that environments are not homogeneous. They, they are not well-mixed. Uh, and so uh, you can imagine the bacterial infection starts in one place in the lung and then, um, sorry, a, a viral infection starts in one place in the lung and maybe it spreads. And uh, maybe the same thing, a virus is one place in the soil, how can it get to the other? Um, it, it's, it's not necessarily motile. And so we looked at viral infection in, uh, in, in what are called swarms. Swarms are these, uh, these large collectives of bacteria um, that will arise before biofilm formation. You can think of um, biofilms and swarms um, being different sides of the same coin. Uh, biofilms are when uh, bacteria are kind of um, uh, asleep or in, in dormant, and then swarms are when uh, bacteria are, are very active. Um, bacterial swarms search space for nutrients. They're very dense, they're very active, and um, they form these, these really beautiful uh, tendrils. So we're, we're gonna go through these movies where we're looking at these plates. Um, these are about 10 centimeters in, um, in diameter. And um, you can see, so we start off with just bacteria um, at the center here. We're only starting off with um, several thousand bacteria. And uh, what's going to happen is that um, they're going to start moving and then they form these tendrils and they move out uh, and potentially search space. Um, what's really amazing is that um, these tendrils, um, they resemble these physical, um, uh, uh, these physical observations of hydrodynamics instabilities. And so they look, they look like a material, right? So, so the question here is, where does the biology end and where does, it, where does the physics begin? Is this a material? property or is it something that the is it a biological property and, and so that's something that we're um, currently investigating um and it, it a lot of this has to do with this uh this remnant lipid layer this surfactant layer that um we're not able to i'm not able to show you um but is uh it's something that that's something sorry i don't have the data to show you this right now that we're working on the dynamics of this surfactant layer but the the way the surfactant layer works is that um basically create if, if bacteria are grown on the surface um, what happens is they resurface that surface um, to their liking. And this is something kind of like maybe like uh, I could describe as if you've ever been ice skating, um, uh, some, what happens after you ice skate for a while is the ice becomes kind of rough and you don't glide very smoothly. And so if you can resurface it, uh, change the material um, properties of the surface, then you glide a little bit smoother. 
And so, so, so this bacterium uh, basically can, uh, carries around its own version of a resurfacer. If the surface is not good, they resurface it and then they can move around on it. Um, and uh, again, what's really amazing is that um, these tendrils that they form, um, they, um, they look like an inert material. So in this, this is a, uh, what we call a Healy Shaw cell where you're just injecting a liquid and it's displacing another liquid. And you can form very similar patterns um, that are described by these staff and Taylor um, instabilities. Um, and so uh, some of the work that we're doing right now is understanding how this motility works. Um, but we wanted to get back to the original question, was, uh, which was, how does the virus spread um, when, they're, uh, when they're in this situation? Okay. And so um, what we did is we came up. That was the last blink that did it. <laughs> In. Okay, let's see. So we don't have that much more material to go. Okay, we'll see how, how long this will last. Um, uh, so what we originally, oops. Okay, let's see. Um, I can do is see, I think that crashed the <laughs> the laptop. Okay, uh, let me see. I, I might have to uh, restart some stuff. Give me one second. Okay, all right. Let's try this again. Okay, start, um, let's see. Okay. No, okay. Let me, let me try a, uh, a dongle. Okay, Actually, let me try, I know one that definitely works. This one. <laughs> Super small. Okay. Okay. Let's do that. Okay, share screen. This one. Okay, are we back up? Let's see. Okay, and I think that was the slide. Okay, great. Okay, hopefully this will. Okay, so um, the first thing that we did was we tried to organize these swarms, um, and we wanted to create these um, centers where we could uh, deposit viruses. And so we were going to deposit these viruses uh, on the outer uh, satellite positions, and basically um, we we're going to see what happens when this center swarm. Um, which does not have a virus, what, 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 what it does. And you can see that these tendrils will reach out um, and uh, impact these satellite colonies um, pretty reliably. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna um, now add virus uh, to this uh, outer, uh, outer position, okay? And we'll see what, what happens to this center swarm, uh, which does not contain a virus, okay? So this is a healthy population. And then this population is kind of decimated by a virus. And what we see is um, amazingly, that this, um, this healthy population is uh, repelled by these um, viral tending, uh, sorry, viral infected populations. Okay. And so um, we went on to understand how, how this works uh, biologically. And uh, right now we're trying to understand how this works um, using fluid mechanics. Um, and what we found was that the stress population emits this molecule that tells um, the rest of the population to stay away. Okay. And so um, this is what we described as a self-quarantining. Um, that uh, a, a viral infected population out here um, would tell um, other parts of the population to um, stay away from it. And um, this may lead the population to um, have a benefit of, of, of greater survival. Okay. And um, the way this works is that the viral infected population emits a molecule called 2-heptyl-3-hydroxy-4-quinolone uh, or PQS. 
Um, and we showed that this PQS is what disrupted the flow of, of this surfactant, okay? And so um, our working model is basically this um, molecule works as a signal for long range communication and it disrupts this surfactant layer flow um, and this leads to uh, segregation of, of populations from a healthy population from a uh, viral infected population. Okay, and so what we found was that uh, phage infected, uh, phage infection or antibi um, antibiotics also do this. So it was a general stress um, pathway. It induces a self quarantine. So the, um, the infected or the stressed population would quarantine from the rest of the population. And this involved um, uh, this molecule called PQS um, and the healthy population avoids uh, the stressor entirely. Um, this really demonstrated uh, effective evasion of bacteria from viruses and it is another demonstration of when the bacteria acts as a collective, um, it gives rise to this robustness or resilience uh, function. Okay, all right, so the last thing I wanted to tell you about uh, was how we are um, addressing uh, the pathogenicity of, of bacteria um, by constructing new antibiotics. Um, and so uh, bacterial that are bacteria that are becoming resistant to antibiotics are becoming a major problem. Currently, there are about 700,000 deaths a year due to bacteria that we can't uh, treat. Um, and kind of a way I like to think about this is just in terms of life expectancy. Uh, before antibiotics uh, were invented, the average life expectancy was about 34 years. Of course, there are other things in medicine that have um, extended life expectancy. Um, but we're slowly uh, regressing into this situation where we don't have antibiotics um, to treat um, uh, bacteria. Um, and so by 2050, the amount of deaths uh, per year could eclipse uh, cancer um, uh, due, to due to these bacteria. And so our approach at trying to um, address this problem was to look at how our immune system kills bacteria. Um, our immune system is very good at killing bacteria to a certain degree. And what we wanted to do is try to leverage immune mechanisms um, so we can learn from our immune system uh, to develop a new strategy. Um, the way our immune system works is uh, we have neutrophils. These are these uh, sentinels that get sent out um, that can kill bacteria. Um, and a lot of the mechanisms that uh, are used by neutrophils to kill bacteria um, uh, are still not studied, um, not well understood. Um, and so what we looked at, so some things are understood. So we understand how reactive chlorus species can kill uh, bacteria. That that's something that we use, um, for example, in bleach. Um, we look at how reactive oxygen species, we understand how reactive oxygen species work, um, but we don't really understand how histones uh, and antimicrobial peptides um, um, work as antimicrobials. And so um, some new antimicrobial peptides are coming down the line as potential treatments, um, but uh, we found that um, there may be other mechanisms inside the immune system that may be able to work as uh, antibiotics. And the one that we focused on was histones because little is, is really known about how, how, they, how their antimicrobial activity um, could arise. Histones are, are these proteins that condense DNA. Um, so, uh, so DNA inside one cell, if you were to pull it out linearly, it would span about two meters. Um, but DNA, these histones help DNA condense into just one 30 micron squared um, area. So I think about histones as a biological file compressor. Um, and so the, our hypothesis was that if the, these histones um, interacted with bacteria, they could inappropriately condense bacterial DNA because bacteria don't have these types of um, proteins that condense their DNA. And so what we did was um, we needed a way to get histones inside bacteria first. And so we use these uh, antimicrobial peptides, which are also produced in neutrophils. And um, in one particular antimicrobial peptide is L37, and it forms these really nice pores inside the bacterial membrane. Um, and what we found was that um, if you combined this pore former with histones, uh, the histones could get inside the bacteria really well. And so we're looking at fluorescence of, of histones. Um, and once they're inside, um, once histones were inside the bacteria, they could rearrange their, their DNA um, inappropriately. So uh, what we found was that um, uh, in untreated, in histone treated, or in just antimicrobial um, peptide treated cells, the histones, uh, the, the genomes were fine, the chromosomes were fine. But then when you had both, um, you had this rearrangement of the, um, of the DNA. Um, and we, we looked at that using different markers. We used that uh, one using just a uh, fluorescence DNA dye, another one using a uh, chromosomal tracker uh, protein. Um, we also, and, and the amazing thing that happened was that um, the cells would kind of blow up um, when you combine the histones with these antimicrobial peptides. You would see loss of cytoplasmic um, uh, contents, and then you would see a lot of this insoluble material that would come out of the cells uh, when they were treated with both histones and L37. 
we're using electron microscopy to understand the mechanism a little bit about um, how the histones are actually getting in. We find these really nice um, pores that form when you use the antimicrobial peptide polymixin B with histones. And so we found these um, uh, really nice novel pores um, that we may be able to take advantage of um, in order to uh, uh, kill bacteria. Um, and so we've, we did a little bit of modeling uh, to understand uh, exactly what was the dynamics, what led um, to this uh, antimicrobial combination uh, to become so potent. And we describe this as a positive feedback loop. So the um, AMPs will form, form pores, the antimicrobial peptides will form pores, the histones um, will then lead to uh, pore stabilization and uh, um, uh, kind of reorganize the chromosome. And this leads to what we describe as uh, antimicrobial synergy. Um, this leads to a positive feedback loop, which then allows um, these molecules to enter the bacteria really well. Um, so we think that this uh, type of synergy um, uh, between histones and antimicrobial peptides could lead to a, a potent new class of uh, antibiotics. Um, and so that's, that's a work that's ongoing right now. Um, so we found that mammalian histones and poor forming antimicrobial peptides work collectively against bacteria um, very effectively. And we think that they're the missing link to understanding a new immune system um, mechanism. Um, and we think that this can be leveraged um, to, uh, as a new strategy. Um, to uh, summarize everything that I've talked about, uh, um, we found that um, there are a lot of emergent properties that, um, uh, that one observes when you start uh, uh, bringing cells into uh, larger collectives. Uh, we, at one length scale, the um, cellular length scale, we found that bacteria could disperse when they are, um, work as a collective, um, and that is done through dynamic switching. At another length scale, we found that um, uh, using fluorescent lifetime, uh, we found that electron carrier states um, um, different, emerge when they are in collectives. Um, in long range communication or organismal length scale, we found that um, they can communicate the presence of a stressor um, by, producing, by perturbing the hydro hydrodynamic flows um, of the collective. Um, and then finally, um, we think that we can defeat bacterial defenses using histones and pore forming antimicrobials as a uh, strategy to rearrange uh, bacterial DNA. Okay. Um, and so uh, the work in here was done by uh, a lot of students uh, in my lab. Um, Louis Brew and Leora Duong uh, uh, in particular uh, have contributed a lot, uh, Lauren Urban. And then we have a lot of collaborators both at UCI and uh, kind of at, at different places. Um, as, uh, we also have Steve Gross um, contributed a lot to the Histones Project, uh, Nina hoyland Crospo at University of Copenhagen, and then uh, there's Katrina Whiteson um, at uh, UCI as well. Right. Um, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions that you may have. Yes. Uh, it's it's a good yeah so so um it's a good question uh there has been thought of uh kind of using the properties of pqs to um, affect um, pseudomonas and we're still looking at exactly how pqs operates um it's it's a bit of a mysterious uh, molecule um, at the moment but it, it's very interesting Oh yeah. Okay. Let's see. Okay. No. Let me see. In the chat. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, three on Zoom right now. Yeah. <laughs> there were more before. Okay, any questions from Zoom? It, it's a good question. Um, we haven't explored uh, what happens on a, a mucus. Uh, layer. Um, it's it's a system that we are trying to establish. Um, so we are trying to develop a um, organ on chip uh, model where we have uh, a mucus layer and uh, understand where the bacteria or how the bacteria will um, progress in such an environment. Um, using a microfluidic device is a, is a little bit artificial, right? Like the, um, we're missing a lot of the properties. And so we're hoping that we can 
uh, slowly restore the mechanical properties um, of a uh, of a, a cell a host environment. So we have been working with the bacteria and the pictures here. And a lot of the things that we found here, and this was another book, that when you have a when mucus present, then the pitch is more effective to finding a bacteria than when the leaf is not present. And so we've been thinking about that, and we have been saying, okay, that's because that is a sticking mechanism, which we also try to find because there's no way to be. You know, so it gets stuck and all stuck. And we've been thinking that there were other stuff as well, but we said, look at the transcription, right? But that's also a sticking and an unsticking. Mm -hmm. So you brought that all up in your first paragraph as well. What I did was did see this this branching that's you know, when you go in against the flow, when you are stuck, and then you go with the flow when you're unstuck, then the stuck and the unstuck. Makes you spread things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in the context of the transcription factors, or maybe it's just stuck with the or not, I, I don't see how that could become because you know, maybe you have to go here. I don't know. I just mm. think it's also not a good way. I mean, I think that was interesting to me. Yeah. But I feel like we still didn't really get the mechanism on why the second mechanism. Yeah, I guess one one thing I, I may say about that is that imagine that you're a transcription factor and you want to um, you and that what you're trying to bind to is that all the way like two meters at the end of the linear DNA and you just move linearly across that right that would take too long right. Um, and so, and so that it, uh, by being able to unstick and then stick somewhere else, like moving, you know, to to, to a different dimension, it, it reduces the complexity of the problem, or it, it increases the efficiency of their ability to search for something. And I can imagine Paige possibly doing something similar, where if you're trying to search for bacteria, you don't necessarily want to kind of stick to the same colony, but you want to unstick, right? And then that may move you to like a totally different part of the colony, or um just uh, yeah 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 that's that's interesting yeah 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 okay uh, thank you